Okay, good morning. I think we have a good number of folks uh, ready to join us today. Um, thank you for tuning in this morning. I'm Dr. Jason Bolton, Vice President of Community Partnerships and Admissions for the Help Group, and I will be moderating today's webcast entitled Supporting the Mental Well-Being of Young People During the Holidays. Since August of 2020, we have offered a series of webcasts that have covered a wide range of topics. Actually, today is our 19th webcast since then. So those of you who join us in January will, 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 will be there for our 20th. I don't know, maybe I'll have a balloon in the background or something. Um, so we have covered a wide range of topics, including the mental health impact of the pandemic on our youth, the benefits of psychotherapy for autistic individuals, the intersection between autism spectrum disorder and LGBTQIA+, and most recently last month, uh, COVID regression or learning disability. You can find each of those webcasts as well as the other, whatever 19 minus the ones I just mentioned are, uh, on our uh, website at www.thehelpgroup/webcasts. Uh, and also there you will see um, a couple of virtual open houses uh, where I describe our non-public schools that we operate. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And you'll also see a podcast uh, that I was on talking about uh, non-public schools. So if you go to that website, you will see all, all of that. For almost 50 years, the Health Group has prided itself in creating new programs responsive to emerging needs within the communities we serve in recent years alone, we have launched a new school for students with learning disabilities or autism who are interested in science, engineering, technology, and math. We've opened a coaching program for young adults who need support and guidance to enter college or the workforce, a prevention and aftercare program to ameliorate child maltreatment in LA, an early detection program for adolescents and young adults experiencing concerning psychiatric symptoms designed to prevent their escalation into a fully diagnosable disorder, of which one of our speakers is a, is a piece of, uh, and a program for young people in the LGBTQ plus community with affirming care called Kaleidoscope. In that same spirit, spirit of responsiveness, recognizing the overall increasing mental health needs in our communities and the difficulties many are experiencing in accessing needed services, the Help Group has recently opened the Lumina Counseling Center. Lumina offers health insurance funded and private pay individual, group, couples, and family therapy, as well as psychoeducational evaluations and diagnostic assessments. Our goal is to meet our clients where they are and to build strong, trusting, and compassionate therapeutic alliances with those seeking our support. As with Kaleidoscope, Lumina also embraces affirming care as a core value, as here, to help neurotypical and neurodivergent people of all ages, gender expressions, and sexual orientations. With that in mind, I would like to tell you about today's speakers who will lead us in an important discussion. Uh, about mental well-being of young people during the holidays. Dr. Lucina Babiance obtained her master's and doctorate degrees from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology in LA. Dr. Lucina currently serves as a professor at the Chicago School and as a postdoctoral psychology intern at the Help Group. Her previous work experience includes a 13-year service at Cedar sinai Medical Hospital, the College Medical Center in Long Beach, and Maryvale Group Home for Sexually Exploited and Abused Children. Dr. Lucina is also a singer and a songwriter and has an album release dedicated to the victims of Armenian Genocide. She has initiated and conducted international projects overseas to help post-war populations and refugees to heal from complex trauma. She's a former refugee herself and has been working with populations exhibiting complex trauma, personality disorders, depression, and anxiety, and her own research is on the topic of narcissistic personality disorder. She is a founder of Servant Leaders of the World, an organization that focuses on raising the leaders of tomorrow with a value-based system of serving by leading and leading by serving, the only type of leadership style, according to Dr. Lestina, that is able to offer true healing to the world. 
Rosalinda Sanchez is a licensed marriage and family therapist and is currently the program coordinator for the Help Group's Peer Early Psychosis Program, which is based on the Portland Identification Early Referral Model for Psychosis, which is one of the programs that I mentioned earlier, and uh, has also been a therapist and a supervisor. She's been with the Help Group for 11 years, nine of those as a therapist for our intensive family programs, effort full service partnership programs, and she considers it a privilege having obtained most of her clinical experience working in this, these intensive programs, providing mental health services to underserved populations. Rosalinda's top priority is to nurture our new peer program, provide strong leadership to her multidisciplinary team, and her continued growth as a therapist, coordinator, and supervisor. She describes herself as passionate, empathic, caring, funny, understanding, fair, and strong, and I think you will see all those qualities today as she is speaking. I'll put a little pressure on you there, Rosalinda. You've got to be passionate, empathic, care. Okay. How about just most of those? Okay. Now that you've heard a bit about our presenters, we would like to know a little bit about you. You should now see a short poll pop up on your screen. And I'll give you some time to answer those questions. We just like to know who's participating with us today. And I'll give you a minute or so to answer them all. So here they are on your screen. If you'll just go ahead and start answering those. Um, when you do finish uh, answering those questions, you will have to X out of the screen on the top right-hand corner or, um, uh, or that will stay up there and obscure all of our pretty faces for the entire time. So folks are, are answering, thank you very much. We'll give us a couple, couple minutes here. Those of you who have been with us before know that you've done this several times. A few more seconds here. Like most people have gotten their answers in, maybe about 10 people left. Okay, so what I see here is uh, it's, it's close to 50-50. So about, um, about, uh, about half of you have been with us before and half of you are new. So welcome to those of you who are new and for those of you who have found value in previous ones, we're glad, that, we're glad to have you back and excited to have you continue with us as we do these each month. Um, we did ask also if folks were parents, teachers, mental health providers, or other, um, and uh, we have um, about 40% of the audience is uh, mental health providers and about a quarter are parents. Um, uh, a lot of others, so not sure what what uh, what categories that is, but we again welcome everyone who has come today. Um, I'm excited about the holiday season, and this is really the result that we that we expected. Um, about half the people say it's a mixed bag, so you're going to certainly hear uh, a little bit more about that today. And then lastly, just interested to know if you have children or clients or other family members who struggle during the holidays and three quarters of you endorse that you do. So you're in the right spot and thank you for, uh, for uh, entertaining us with the poll. Um, again, remember to hit the X button so that you get that off of, off of the screen. We are honored uh, that you have chosen to spend another hour with us. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the help group. Among other social and mental health services serving the entirety of LA County, including outpatient mental health services and intensive family intervention programs, Kaleidoscope and the Lumina Counseling Center, the Help Group also operates 14 non-public schools in Los Angeles County for students with autism spectrum disorders, learning disabilities, ADHD, developmental delays, and emotional challenges. We contract with more than 80 local education authorities to provide special education and related services to approximately 1,000 students. During the presentation, you may use the chat function to present questions you would like the panelists to address. For the first time in this presentation, um, the presenters also plan to ask you to participate a couple of times by sending them chats. 
So look for that as well. So you can do both. Don't worry about categorizing. You can ask us general questions um, and you can also respond uh, if Lucina and Rosalinda ask you to as well. And we'll be monitoring uh, those, those chats. We will have a Q&A section at the end of the website and we will attempt to answer as many of those questions as we can. From doing several webcasts, uh, what we know for sure is that we will not be able to get to all the questions. So if we have a good number of salient questions that we feel that, uh, that uh, would be of interest to the audience, well, we will uh, follow up this broadcast with an email uh, with some of the answers to those questions uh, were they to appear. All right, enough of me. I now have the great pleasure of introducing our speakers this morning. Dr. Lucina Babayantz and Rosalinda Sanchez. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, let's start. Well, first of all, I do want to welcome our lovely audience and our colleagues. Thank you all for being here today. Let's go. This is going to be a webinar about supporting mental health of well-being of young people during holidays. And the reason why we decided to do this because everybody takes holidays differently. For some people, it is a happy period of life, and for others, it is the most excruciating one. So we do want to raise awareness about, um, about how holidays are perceived by people, and this webinar is going to give us an opportunity to do that. Let's go to the next slide. You see, I was also wanting to point out that, you know, you think about it, we go through a whole year, and it's just regular, um, go to school, go to work, we have a routine. And all of a sudden, at the end of the year, there's this big event that we're supposed to be participating in. And it just kind of, you know, even though we know it happens every year, it just always catches us by surprise. And we know when uh, for youth, it's especially, you know, it could be all kinds of feelings happening because you get the break. But at the same time, you don't have your friends. You're supposed to be happy doing family stuff, but you may not always have the, the best environment. So there is a lot of stuff that comes up for our youth. During Absolutely, this. Rosalinda. I'm so happy you mentioned this because we're going to be covering uh, anxiety later, guys. And um, when it comes to anxiety, people have anxiety from positive events as well as negative events, right? So like when you're about to get that promotion or when you are going to do a public speaking, that is anxiety as well. So it's kind of similar. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, it is very anxiety provoking having holidays or holiday season. And our general agenda, we're going to be covering a lot of topics today. You can pretty much look at this um, in the presentation, all of the topics. Hopefully that some of these topics will directly uh, be answering your own questions or um, that you can relate to um, or, you know, you've experienced this. And if that happens, please use the um chat box because we would love to have you your opinions and your uh, feelings also reflected and even though uh, you guys are muted but please do not um, hesitate to express your voice in the chat box because this is how we're going to be able to actually have a dialogue in a way right um let's go to the next slide so some of the goals we want to cover for this webinar is good mental health for all, right? We all deserve that. Um, provide quality education for all. Uh, when we have education about our symptoms, guess what? You know, it becomes much less threatening. Anxiety drops if we know what to expect. Uh, promoting servant leadership values and support. Servant uh, servants that lead and leaders that serve are the type of leadership style that can offer healing. Um, community partnership involvement. It takes a village to raise a good child and to build a responsible community. And the help group is that village. And you guys are also part of that village because together we can make a difference. Peace, safe space, and inclusiveness. Uh, promoting peaceful and inclusive environment for all so um, for seeking healing and support. Everyone is welcome, welcomed and loved. Let's go to another slide, please. Okay, so before we even start, I want to ask a question from our audience. What are some of the feelings, both positive and negative, that you may have experienced during holidays? Uh, please 
type them up in the chat box. Let us see what's coming and uh, let's see what you guys have been experiencing. When you hear the, the word holidays, what is it for you? Yeah, it sounds like it's a, it could be a lot of pressure for me. There's a lot of expectations that happen. Family disagreements. Uh, you know, wanting to, to find that uh, family support, right? But you know that maybe uh, family isn't going to bring you what you need. There's always that like, oh, I'm hoping next time I see my uncle, he's going to be, you know, nicer. And he still is very judgmental. But we still put ourselves in the situations where I have to go, you know, because I'm one of the family. So there's all these like nice feelings, right? It's the holidays. Um, the lights are supposed to make you happy, right? And joyful. But at the same time, there's this mixed bag of like emotions that I think really? is overwhelming. We have, I can, one thing I can tell, even though I don't see your faces, we have an amazing audience because, you know, they're right on point. They're, they're literally, you know, typing all the feelings, all the triggers, everything that we're pretty much going to cover today. Financial issues. I saw that one as well, as well, anxieties and, you know, a dread family dramas, right? So <clears throat> keep on, keep on doing. Yes, absolutely. All of this is 100% correct. Let's go to another slide actually look at what we have well cnn and rosalinda i just wanted to jump in real fast to just remind everyone first of all amazing the amount of responses you got with your question that's it's that's awesome just want to remind everyone that when you do chat it's only visible to the panelists so um you know if you have something that you want to say and you would worry about the entire audience seeing it they're not seeing it the chat is just coming to uh, us that's why you're also not seeing all these answers on the side there's there's probably been 50 answers so um thank you for everybody for participating and you can feel that your answers can be kept confidential as well great thank you jason thank you so some of the negative feelings that might be experienced during the holidays. Russell, Linda, do you want to go over them? So we can sure. You know, there, there's this tendency to to feel overwhelmed. You know, sadness, anxiousness, anger, depression, traumatized, scared, loneliness. I'm sorry, my abandonment, suicidal, grief, stress, irritability, financial burdens, flu, COVID. I mean, sometimes, Lucina, I don't know about you, but sometimes I could feel, uh, feel several of those emotions, you know, throughout the day. So I start off being happy, you know, and as the day goes on, I'm all these anxious and, and anger and depressed. You know, there's just so many things. There's not just one feeling, I think, that just sits with a person. There's all these, you know, especially, again, during this unpredictable time that we know is coming but also, it's just so, it's saturated with so much that it's Absolutely. normal. Right? I, want to do, I want to do a little self-disclosure here. Rosalinda, out of uh, what we have on the screen, which ones, give me a, a one or a few that you actually experienced during the holidays. Okay, well, I'm always about, <laughs> I'm always about being overwhelmed. Okay. I'm always, it feels stress because I feel like I have to fill in the time with, like my son's home from school and what are we going to do? Are we going to have, you know, money to do fun stuff or just be bored? Um, I guess depressed. I'm naturally, you know, have this depression about me, about what I don't have and where I'm at in my life. Um, and, you know, there's, there's these feelings of like wanting to be happy. Um, but then again, I, I compare myself to all these wonderful holiday movies that don't happen to me. And then I know that aren't real but it's still kind of that comparison to what other people have. And it does, it does bring a lot of stress. Absolutely. Absolutely. For me, it is actually grief and loss because I do, um, I lost some family members um, to another world. So there's no way I can bring them back. And that is, you, you know, I have those memories for myself when they were around. And of course, financial burdens, right? Like buying all these gifts and who am I going to get gifts for? And it, it's, it's, it is an anxious period of time, even though I do enjoy holidays, especially the end of the year. But even with with the fact that I like holidays, I still experience anxiety. So, yeah, yes. let's go to the next slide. Please. Yeah. And I just wanted to point out there was a, a comment about uh, about, you know, when we engage with family, uh, if you're like me, I come from a of a a Mexican family where we don't talk about feelings, right? So there's no, everybody's good all the time. 
we're not talking about like, hey, it's all very superficial on the air, you know, how, how are, you know, how's school, but they don't really want to know more, right? So it is get, it does get to be a challenge to be around family that ask you questions that you really don't want to respond to, but really they're not going to understand, right? Exactly. If you respond. So when you say you don't, you guys don't talk about feelings, you don't talk about negative feelings or you don't talk about like positive even feelings are you oh I mean it's like it's like we don't talk about Bruno you don't talk about like what's going on about like you know I'm going through a hard time you know I'm struggling with work I'm overwhelmed with my child I'm not because you know what we don't want them to worry but also because you're supposed to be tough and just get through it right it's just like in my days we used to walk through the snow 10 miles or whatever to get to school we're supposed to represent that that sturdiness, that toughness, that ability to, you know, endure. And you know what? I, I don't want to hear like, oh, I'm so sorry, but why? <laughs> yeah, we have a comment. Somebody, you know, from RV says that I grew up uh, like that too. Everybody, everything is brushed under the carpet, right? It is. And thank you for, in fact, thank you for actually um, putting that in the chat because so many people can relate. You know, I grew up in the same culture as well, where you don't talk, we don't talk about negative feelings, right? So if it's positive, yeah, you know, everybody wants to hear about your positive and successful stories. But if it's something negative, yeah, it is brushed under the carpet. So for sure, we can, many of us can relate, Rosalinda. Right. And I think right. later on, you see, now we do talk about cognitive dissidence. About yes, how- I can't yeah. wait to get to that. <laughs> Hold the thought, please. That's my favorite one. Okay, let's go to another slide. All right, so let's cover some of the facts. I'll cover the first two. Uh, six, actually, no, uh, Rosalinda, if you want to cover the first two, I'll, I'll cover the other two. Okay, absolutely. And again, I want to just, uh, you know, I, my, I have a little bit of dyslexia, so please, if I don't say the stuff right, just bear with me, look at the, the slide. 64% of people with mental health illness report that the holidays make their condition worse. And that is according to the NAMI 2001. That is the majority. Look at that. Yeah, that's pretty high up statistics. 50% increase in suicide attempts among adolescent girls ages 12 to 17 during uh, the pandemic, which is incredibly staggering. Right. And 30% increase in overdoses, approximately 93,000 per year, guys. And let's say like it's, it's going to be about 250 people die every day from overdose or like 11 each hour. That's according to Journal of Health and Science 121. And this is a staggering loss of human life, says Brandon Marshall, a Brown University public health researcher who tracks overdose trends. Um, you know, it is a tragedy when you realize how people are truly suffering during holidays. And the facts here are pretty much the proofs of this sad reality. Um, so it is real, guys. <clears throat> and, I, and I also wanted to, one of our, our um, respondents was pointing out how if you do get together to the holidays, you know, there's a tendency to have those family arguments you know you're not going to be on the same page about things whether that be politics or religion i know i get it every time when i go home how how come i'm not going to church be closer to god you know i'm saving you know try to save your soul and i just like tune my dad out like just you know stop so there's a tendency to feel that pressure of just having to have different opinions in the household and we know emotional um emotions grow higher when we're it's personal when it has to do with families right so that could be in itself something that's going to make us while we go into the household feeling like a you know an older person and being ourselves we come out feeling like our seven-year-old selves like we're getting scolded right and that could bring up a lot of emotions as true that comes from you know visiting from college you know the the person goes out to college gets all this knowledge and is trying to uh, you know be themselves and they come back home and it's like, whoa, who are you? Uh, you know, you weren't, you weren't uh, saying so much. You didn't have so many opinions. But now you're coming home and you're like pointing out like what's wrong or, you know, it, it's a difficult situation. Absolutely. Messy. Yes. And it is important for, this is where the good communication comes in, right? If you're a parent 
I don't know <clears throat> if you have how many parents we have in the audience who have children in colleges, and then they come in with their dirty laundry. They come in with their own, they want to unwind. They want unstructured time. They want to eat the whole fridge you have, whatever you have in the fridge, right? And um, how do we handle? Because we kind of, we're used to, as parents now that children are out, we're used to our calm and quiet time. And all of a sudden, all the stress, and you know, comes in. So it's very important to communicate with your kids while meeting their needs. They need to meet their needs too, right? They want some unstructured time. They have a right for it. It's their vacation from school and from maybe a noisy roommate. Um, so give them that time, um, but set boundaries still. You know, you can be as messy as you want, but let's say at five o'clock, you start cleaning because I'm expecting some people or whatever. Give them the time that they can actually enjoy themselves without having a structured environment. But then a little bit you know, later, introduce the structure and say, you know, this is what we need to have some structure in the family. And um, that's just going to run the family better. So and it's important to voice your own needs. I need to rest. Can you lower, lower the music a little bit or, you know, put your headphones on? Right. So because holidays should be. Um, pleasant time for everyone, not just for one person. So it takes a lot of communication for everyone to um, com communicate, contribute in order to make it a pleasant time. And I love this saying, uh, somebody, one of the, one of my actually clients said it, and I love them, said, I'm going to steal it. I'm going to use it everywhere. A successful marriage is when one person goes crazy at the time. How true is that, right? Because if we have if we have two people, Rosalinda, fighting, fighting, fighting. Exactly. Never goes anywhere, right? Yes. Right. And I think it's also, to, it's a good uh, thing to point out, Lucina, that we really need to be patient with ourselves. I mean, this is also a sort of transitional period, uh, a developmental stage in both mom and, and parents and, and children is that this is something new, right? You're, you're coming back and the kids are growing and being themselves and they're, they're new people, essentially. They're not the little kids that we remember. So I think it takes a lot of patience on both parts to know that things are going to be different and we have to be, we have to be able to breathe together and be under that household and how to minimize the stress while we're enjoying this family time. Right, and how about using humor? How about using humor, Rosalind? <laughs> yes, I'm still looking for my humor that I put on my, my bio, but I hope <laughs> it will come out at some point. <laughs> well, Jason advertised it, so we're... <laughs> I know, I feel like <laughs> the pressure's on. There you, there you go. I, you know, I actually prescribe comedy clubs for my uh, clients. Um, you know, if they're too sad, I'm like, listen, just put that comedy movie on, on Netflix or even go to a comedy club. You know, it feels much better when we laugh, right? So... Um, for sure. Let's go to the next slide and see what we have there. Foster youth. Okay, so I definitely were covering this because my personal awareness how holidays can be dreadful to some people actually comes from my experience. I used to work at the Merrillville uh, group home as a counselor uh, first, not as a therapist. So as a counselor, you had slightly different responsibilities. Um, even before you get a job, they make you sign a paper that if a child hits you or attacks you, you're not going to sue them because all these children were from sexually exploited and abused uh, environments with a lot of trauma. And also, um, when they would come to you for a hug and ask for a hug, you were supposed to give it. So if you're not comfortable with giving hugs, you cannot get a job in that facility. And the reason is because these children uh, are not adoptable. They're actually labeled as not adoptable due to so many severe behaviors. So I got the job even um, and, and <clears throat> as a counselor and working night shifts. And um, there was a girl, um, African-American child, whose name was Brooke. And all of a sudden, nobody understood what was happening with her. But every time she's been there for like um, eight years, and every time there was a holiday coming in at the end of the year, um, she would start uh, breaking windows, like severe, severe uh, behaviors that we didn't understand what was happening. And then um, as a counselor, I was supposed to take children to schools. On the way, when I was dropping her to school, 
she looked at the window and she said, uh, I, I knew she had a, actually, I knew she had a Christmas performance that day at school. I said, hey, Brooke, I, by the way, I, na- I changed her name just for, you know, for the confidentiality purposes. So I said, hey, Brooke, you know, good luck for your performance today. And she looked at the window and she said, who cares? Nobody, nobody's going to watch me anyways. And then uh, I, I called my supervisor and I said, um, I know my shift is over. Can I ask? actually stay and watch her for a performance and she said oh my god we're not paying you but hey if you want to do that on your own time be my guest so I stayed and what I saw changed my mind completely about holidays so what I saw the, the, the scene was that all these children were sitting um together on the stage um with box around them like like almost like they're the gifts themselves right and their head was sticking out out of the box so I see all the children on the stage with their heads up and singing, and there's only one box where I don't see a head. And I knew immediately it was Brooke. Her head was inside the box, guys. So I, and, and she's just not coming out. The whole, you know, half of the song is already gone, and she's not coming out. She's hiding from everyone. So I decided to embarrass myself, and I just screamed in the middle of performance, Hey, Brooke! really loud like everybody looked it was the most embarrassing moment but then she looked up and she her you know she rose her head and I kid you not her voice was the loudest among all the kids and then after the performance she came up grabbed my hand and said this is my mom nobody cared that she was a black child I was white this is her I was her mom for that second and I realized that the reason the reason why these children especially in foster care or, or group homes, that they are significantly engaging in maladaptive behaviors um, during holidays, especially, is because of that trauma, is because of that comparing themselves to others, is because of that pain that nobody comes to watch them during performances. So that was my, you know, aha moment. Leonard Schengold in 1991 used the term soul murders when he described abuse or neglect of children that deprives them of their identity and ability to experience joy in life. So holidays don't make it better for these children. It actually makes it worse. Thank you for sharing, Lucina. And it just goes to show that we really don't know what's going on in an individual, right, unless we really ask and take the time to, to listen to what's going on. So thank you for that. Absolutely. And here's our favorite topic of cognitive dissonance. So what are what is cognitive dissonance? Believe it or not, a lot of our symptoms actually come from as a result of cognitive dissonance, especially in you, especially during the holidays, right? Like for example, holidays are a happy, um, supposed to be a happy time for everyone, but then I am not happy because I lack certain people in my life or resources. That is a cognitive dissonance, right? When the attitude does not match the behavior so um so definitely holidays can create cognitive dissonance Mm. attitudes contradict the behavior basically that's what it is when you have that you can just label and say okay i have cognitive dissonance right now because my attitude is not corresponding to behavior right and one thing that i was reading that kind of brought it home to me it's it was an example of you know a person who smokes um cigarettes and they know it's bad for their health. Right. Still doing the, the, the behavior. I, I just read a comment that um, somebody, you know, liked the story. And thank you so much, guys, for continuing to um, put some feedback in the chat. We can, we, you know, sometimes as we're, te- as we're talking and doing webinar, sometimes we can glance at it as well and read your comments. So continue doing that. Thank you. Yes. And um, it is mental stress experienced by the individual who holds Um, two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values at the same time, right? For example, let's say um, you have a dog, and you always, you know, take a little back. So when your dog does a little business outside, you can put, you know, it in the back and nicely, you know, throw it away. But let's say you forgot your back, a little back, right? And then you go with the dog outside, and the dog does its own business, and then you leave it there because you don't have anything to, you know, to clean it with. 
then you come home and all this guilt and all this, oh my God, I feel bad or you know, I should have done it. That is a cognitive dissonance. So anytime attitude is not corresponding to behavior, that is what. And how does this affect us, Lucina? How is this affecting? Oh my God. So let's go to the next slide. We're going to definitely get into depth. What does cognitive Lucina dissonance- Lucina and Rosalinda just want to just want to let you know that we probably have maybe six, seven minutes to get before we get to Q&A. Oh, Okay. I didn't want to interrupt that beautiful story, so I yes, couldn't give you the yes, 10 minutes. Yes. Oh, my God. We need to I'm run it. Okay. Right. Whatever we can. Yeah, Rosalinda, let's not stress about it. Whatever we can cover, basically, just quickly, right? Okay. So um, it can lead to anxiety, panic attacks, um, depression, all of that. Uh, all of that That's is what I'm focused on right now. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, let's go to the next slide because we're going to have to kind of go faster now. Tips for resolving cognitive dissonance, right? What are the, the t- when, when we have um, children or when we have clients who come to us and say, you know, um, I'm experiencing this anxiety or depression and you feel that it might be a cognitive dissonance, what do you do? Okay, well, let's ask them back. What are the two cognitions that aren't feeding together? Or what actions would I need to take to eliminate the dissonance? Or uh, do I need to change any specific behavior? Do I need to change a mindset or a belief, you know, and be transparent, be, have that courage to actually um, discuss that? How important is it for me to resolve this dissonance? So basically confronting, this is what you guys need to remember, confronting cognitive dissonance often leads to positive results and a sense of resolution of a problem or a sense of victory. Okay, so confronting is very important. And I was going to add that, especially during the holidays, you know, when the kids are home, you get to see them a little bit more, um, you know, not just rushing off like, hey, bye, hey, hello, bye, um, but you're actually hopefully spending time with them. So you're going to be able to see a little bit more of this cognitive dissonance. Right, right. Absolutely, Rosalinda. Let's, let's, let's look at what can we do to survive holidays, Right. Um, have realistic expectations about self and life, be more kind to one another, engage in gratitude exercise, or utilize higher power. You know, a lot of times we have the strengths that we don't even utilize. Like high, higher power is that strength, for example. Or utilize community resources, supports, churches, clubs, affiliations. By the way, the research says that people who attend religious um, ceremonies leave 10 years longer than others. I want to ask our ad audience to write in the chat do you, if you have a spiritual strength, just kind of put a little plus so we can um, get the idea. Um, self-care, right? Make a plan how to spend holidays. Um, yes, big G. Okay, we have some uh, believers in the audience. Good. Fool your brain, basically. When I say fool your brain, it's when you even smile, Your brain doesn't know the difference between whether you are really, truly happy or not. You know, that alone, if you do that, let's say for a minute or two, you'll start feeling happy because your brain is getting a signal that, oh, I'm happy. That's it. So even try that. Let's go to another slide quickly. I also wanted to add to that, Lucina. Yes. Is that, you know, sometimes music also helps. You know, right now, the waitress's song, I think I'll skip this one this year. It keeps on in the loop of my head about Christmas. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's okay not to get you into know, it. As a musician myself, this is my yeah. refuge from any stress. So I sing all the time, you know. It's, it, I'm glad you mentioned it because that is another strength that we often overlook. We, we're not even, um, you know, we're not even paying attention to that. But, hey, you're right, Rosalinda. If you start your day with a little music, you know, a little, little Nora Jones playing in the background, all of a sudden, you know, your mood is changing for the day, right? Or if you need to complete tasks, it's not as boring anymore because you can clean and you can enjoy it. So absolutely. So we're going to do fast the brain situation here. The, what I want to get, what I want to give you um, when we're talking about the brain, the thing I want you to guys to remember, the most important thing is that the brain is pretty much um, – It changes. Every new experience you have, every new um, feeling you get, your brain literally changes, okay? So we're not doomed by our genes, right? You can change your brain structure. 
The brain changes when you develop new consciousness, big time, right? And the brain processes about 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day. This is how many thoughts we, got, you know, we all have in one day. So it's basically 97, 90% of all these thoughts are the thoughts from the day before. So same thoughts create same choices. Same choices create same behaviors. Same behaviors create same experiences. Same experiences create same emotions. And all of that creates our identity and personality. This is why it's so hard to change personality traits because we are, we're, you know, we're entangling those uh, brain activities. And, and the reason, the way we can change it is if we're going to use the top portion of our brain, which is Freud actually looked at it as an iceberg. And he said that um, the top part, which is contributing to consciousness is from 6% to 10%. So basically, and the, like subconsciousness is like the whole 80%. Unconscious is 10% of your brain. So imagine in order to change anything in your life, in order to change any personality trait, what we need to do is to bring the subconscious to the awareness level, which is to bring uh, things from that 80% to that 10% on top. And psychologists and mental health workers, pretty much what we're doing, we're working with that 10%. You know, that's our hope. That's our bet. Pretty much. Um, let's go to um, another slide. Okay. Are we ready for the questions, Asina? I think we're we might be running low on time. It's okay um, if you have if you have one or two more things to cover, then we'll then we'll move on. Okay, let's go. We already covered subconscious. Let's go to another slide. Let's see how to create a new reality. So the brain does not know the difference. We already know that. So smile more, feel happier right? Um, push yourself out of your comfort zone. This is huge, guys. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a clinician, who, whoever is in the audience, if you want to change any behavior you have, there's no other way around it. You have to push yourself out of your comfort zone, okay? Because then you're starting to feel new emotions, new experiences, even if it's um, a discomfort. Um, in psychology, we call it um, symptom tolerance. So you basically, you know, tolerate that symptom, and of course, reward yourself. Don't forget to reward yourself, you know, whether it's a little piece of chocolate, if you can, or whether it's a movie, whatever. Reward yourself if you having those victories. The I'm experiencing that right now, Lucina, pushing myself out of my comfort zone. So I, get a, I guess I get a big piece of chocolate. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. Let's go to another slide quickly. Let's see. So anxiety, anybody who comes and tells me I have anxiety, I already know they're, they're engaging in two behaviors which is catastrophizing and uh, misinterpreting. And then when I say that, they're like, how do you know? Are you a psychic? No, I'm not. But this is what the science is about. Anybody who's having anxiety is catastrophizing and misinterpreting things, right? What is catastrophizing? So I'm going to die. Like you're, turning, you're taking little things. And it, it, it is so huge all of a sudden it suffocates you, right? And I, I see comments already coming in, right? So yes, and reward yourself, absolutely. We, let's say um, some people say, oh, I'm going to have a heart attack. That's catastrophized. Misinterpreting. There must be something seriously wrong with me. This feeling uh, must mean that I'm choking, right? And a lot of times during anxiety, we get the feeling of choking, but we're not really choking. It's just anxiety doing their all somatic things. So um, leaving in the past is a depression. Leaving in the future is an anxiety. Leaving in the present is a healthy mindset. So what we need to do, we need to constantly bring, bring ourselves in the present in order to have a healthy mindset and much and less symptoms. Okay, the aware technique. So how to deal with anxiety, right? I'm sure a lot of the people in the audience can benefit from this. <clears throat> Abbreviation, aware. Acknowledge your anxiety. So quit, quit fighting it. Once you start running away from anxiety, uh, it catches you. It catches you even more. This is how we have panic attacks. If you imagine anxiety as a wave going up, all you need to do is just to see that the wave does not have a capacity to remain like this, right? It can't. It will go eventually it will go down. So you just need to wait that period and tell yourself, oh, yeah, I know you're going to get down. Yeah, I'm going gonna, gonna to be like that forever. So acknowledge that you're having it. Watch anxiety. Don't judge it, good or bad. Instead, you know, rate it. From zero to 10, what's my anxiety? Five, six, seven, you know? Then you become like your own scientist, your own body, right? Act through it. 
Don't let it prevent you from living life. Avoiding it makes it grow. So even though you're experiencing anxiety, go against the flow. That is what you, this is when you're acting through it. And then repeat steps from one to three. Then expect the best results. Each episode is a new try and there's small gains. And each time you're going you're gonna to go through anxiety and not turn your way back um, and just go against it pretty much, you know, roll with it in a way. Each time that happens, you're going to get confidence that you are in control. Because when you think about anxiety, it's all about control. It's losing control, right? Uh, let's see. PTSD, we're just going to cover it really quickly. Um, it is exposure. Um, because of an exposure to a single traumatic event, accident, assault, and, you know, we have a lot of people with uh, PTSD um, right now, and especially with in foster youth. So um, complex PTSD is a long-term exposure to trauma. Let's go to another slide quickly. Strategies to reduce it is psychoeducation, like pretty much what we're doing right now. We're talking about all the symptoms and, all, you know, I don't know how many people in the audience have PTSD or anxiety, but this is all psychoeducation. And the purpose of this is to, for you to familiarize, familiarize yourself with what, ha what is happening to you. Um, that should reduce, reduce anxiety already because then there's nothing unexpected happening, right? We already know anxiety does this, PTSD does this. Uh, relaxation exercises, breathing, increasing awareness, increasing self-acceptance, uh, support groups, distress tolerance, um, and pretty much practice all of that. PTSD is not a character weakness. It is a learned stress disorder. Yes, and somebody says the more I educate myself in, with mental health, um, uh, the more control I get. Thank you for posting that. Absolutely. How can parents and caregivers help you reduce PTSD. So emotional regulation, cognitive processing, you know, when you can actually do, use maps, drawings, and process that trauma. Don't ever minimize or dismiss, um, you know, comments when people come to you with trauma. Um, because, uh, you know, you always need to validate. All feelings are valid. That's like a law in psychology. Grounding exercises. So with grounding exercises, sometimes I ask my, my clients to take their shoes off in the office and to put their feet on the ground because the temperature change uh, or even to model that to them, right? That, that helps to uh, relax. I have, one, I have one client that is having a lot of anxiety and he said, you know what I do? I actually fill up my sink with some uh, ice and I just ha you know, stick my head into there. And especially during the holiday times when there's so much anxiety and the party is going on. So, why is that working? It is working. And but why is it working? Because in actually in the back right here, we have a vagus nerve, guys. And that is the nerve that is responsible for fight, flight, freeze. So when we change the temperature, when we put something cold, it calms us down. So try it. Um, you know, if you feel anxious next time or having a panic attack, try to do that and see how it works. Mod maybe you can tell us on our during our next webinar. <laughs> modeling calm behavior right that's so important to model it develop compassion empathy and communication and distress tolerance the most important thing when you're having distress think about it you are in control you're the scientist you can tolerate that distress and especially after you tolerate it make sure to reward yourself let's go to another slide the process of change. So quickly about the process of change. There are several seven steps. Step one is to make subconscious conscious and to identify direction. So most people end up on the continuum from victor, survivor, and thriver. So who are victims? Victims usually are the ones who are making decisions based on fear. If you're doing that, you're in the victim space. Who are survivors? There's a great um, definition here. Survivor is someone who lived through hardship or disaster. However, didn't necessarily experience the growth. And we'll stop here. So basically, survivor is somebody who didn't really experience the growth, you know, but he had um, trauma and he lived through it. A thriver is somebody who has experienced the growth during the trauma. And um, that is um, pretty much what is the definition of it. Uh, step two is to engage in daily gratitude exercise. I walk my talk. I wake up. I wake up at 5 a.m. By 6 o'clock, I'm already on my balcony doing gratitude exercise. And that changes the whole 
uh, course of the day. I can guarantee you that because it works for me. Don't believe everything you think. Your brain, brain is tricking you, right? So filter, filter the thoughts, you know. Address cognitive dissonances. We talked about that. Create your own support system, your own tribe, guys. Who are these people? Identify them. That is your support system. Start giving and serving more to others. Anybody who is depressed and, you know, has lack of purpose in life, I suggest them go volunteer. Volunteer and you'll feel much better. And they do, and they come back with amazing stories. Increase pleasurable and positive experiences. So the reason I wanted to cover this process of change, because there's actually a, a, a recipe how to become a thriver. And all you need for that are majorly three ingredients. Positive experiences, which we have step seven in here. Uh, support system, which is step five, your own tribe. And higher purpose, which is giving and serving more to others. So okay. I guess okay. the running okay. outside, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, let's, uh, let's, let's see if we can take a couple of questions. I think we're going to have to invite both of you back. Um, because while, while today was really focused on holidays, so much of what you talked about is more general than that. And we can use on our everyday lives. And from the comments, you can just tell people really appreciate it tonight. Today, it's not night yet, right? Uh, today, how you shared your own personal experiences with all this and and, and it seems to be very well received. So um, I know we have a couple of uh, 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 webcasts already planned for the next couple of months, but I, th I have a feeling that we will be uh, inviting you back to talk a little bit more about uh, about some of these things. So let's um, we have about five minutes. So let me let me at least get to maybe two questions here. Um, Jason, before you go really quickly, somebody asked to repeat the recipe of a thriver. Can I just repeat? Yep, yep, go. So yes, it is uh, positive experiences. You go for hiking, you're singing. Those are positive experiences. Uh, support system, that is your tribe, who are your people, your friends, close ones. And a higher purpose will be the third one. So that is according to a thriver's model. There's actually a, a research done on it. So please take it away. I took my notes on that as well. Um, okay, so here's a, I, I like this question and I know that we could probably do an entire webcast on it. So limit your answer, but know that, you know, it's a big topic, but I, I think people really appreciated when both of you um, talked about your own cultural experiences and how that affected your view of the holidays. So the question was, what about mixed culture, mixed religion families? Um, how does that how does that play out in uh, 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 particularly during the holidays? That's a good. Uh, question. Yeah, that is. You know, just recently, uh, my nephew got engaged to a um, a young lady from. Oh my gosh, I want to say, and I know I'm not even going to be. Um, she's. Uh, I want to say Armenian, and he's Mexican. So what they're doing is that, to be fair, they're doing both sides of the family. So we have to restructure it. Someone's doing Christmas Eve, someone's doing Christmas day, right? So to be respectful to both. And as, as the family understands, like we're only going to get them part-time. So now we have to think about like, you know, it's okay. And we accept the fact that he's now being married into a different family and we have to be okay with it. Oh, I see. You know, my experience is that <clears throat> I'm actually raising Jewish nephews and nieces um, he's my sister's married to a Jewish guy. So we celebrate both. And um, it's not when you have love and respect in the family, when you concentrate on communication, um, this cultural religious differences are really manageable because you're pretty much incorporating what's, what's making sense, right? And it's, it is a, actually, it, is a, it is, enhances even the relationships. So um, absolutely no negative associations with it. If I had to suggest something for uh, mixed families, I would say work on your communications even before, like out, outside of holidays, so that during the holidays everything is rehearsed and you already know what to expect. And for the whole year, you've been practicing, um, you know, positive coping skills and adaptive skills. So holidays become that season when everything just pays off. And I'm going to ask one more question. Again, it's a huge topic, and I'm going to ask for a one-minute answer. Um, but I did see it come across a couple times. So, um, and, and again, we'll invite you back, and we can touch on some of these things. But um, how do I best support teens dealing with grief 
during the holidays? And I know it's big, but if you could be brief, brief about grief. Right. So I think it's really important to don't resist the grief. Allow that time to be able to share feelings, um, to cry, you know, as needed, and maybe be aware of what the feelings are. Write them down, journaling, um, and take care of yourself, right? I know there's a tendency to kind of maybe shut down. Eat what you need to, you know, nourish your, your body. Um, make sure that you get enough sleep, right? So pay attention to the things that I think we we take for granted, but that might be missed during this time. So this is a very good question. Um, and um, oh, I think I'm frozen here, right? Oh, here I'm back. So <clears throat> during the grief, um, a lot of feelings comes up, especially during the holidays. Um, the, the loved ones who departed to another world, right? This is something we cannot really change. So it's, I love the serenity prayer in um, you know, AA meetings. And what they say is, um, you know, God give me serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. So for people who are grieving, if you're grieving about loved ones, you can't return and kind of ask yourself a question, can I change something about the situation? If you can't, accept it, you know, and this is this is what the serenity prayer is about. Another thing, if you can, make a plan to spend holidays with someone. Don't be alone. Don't subject yourself to isolation or loneliness. If you have friends, plan it. Call them. Make arrangements. If, let's say, for some reason, and always have plan B. Plan B is when, let's say, something doesn't follow through, right? And you're going to have to stay at home. Well, plan B is uh, get your favorite food, perhaps, or watch some favorite movie on Netflix. Uh, last week, I was sick with COVID, well, it was COVID, I think was right. And well, all the symptoms were there. I didn't really check. But um, I'll tell you this, it was the best time of my life. And the reason is I was in my bed and, you know, in my room, eating whatever I want, watching all these cartel movies, <laughs> and pretty much doing things I never had a chance to do. I was sick. I was at home. I was isolating, right? So what I'm trying to say is have that plan B. If it's not with friends, see what you can do alone um, by yourself and make sure you are good to yourself. As I said, and this is the third time I'm repeating it, reward yourself for every victory you are having, for every symptom you're conquering, for every symptom tolerance you're actually going through. You you went through that anxiety and that is, um, that wor- that is worth for you to get your own um, rewards and well, Lucina and Rosalinda, you should reward both of yourselves. This was a fantastic uh, presentation. We are uh, thrilled that you have joined us today and shared your experience with us. Everybody, this presentation has been recorded, and we will let you know when it's available to view and to share with your colleagues and friends. If there are any questions in the chat that we weren't able to get today, especially if they follow a certain theme, we will share some of those with you in a follow-up email as well. I want to remind everyone about the Lumina Counseling Center that I talked about earlier. Uh, If you need uh, help, you may reach out to us and find more information at www.luminacounselingla.com. Or you can reach out to us using the phone even, 818-779-5100. We have people answering the phones there who can provide you with a good match to one of our therapists at Lumina. Our next webcast will be entitled, this is very timely if you're watching the news about kids and and attendance. Um, It'll be entitled, My Child Doesn't Want to Go to School, What Should I Do? Uh, And we'll be broadcast live on January 14th at 10 a.m. Pacific. We'll reach out to you in these same channels to tell you about this webcast and tell you more as details emerge. At the HELP Group, we are always we always endeavor to provide the best education to our students and impart what we know and what we have learned about best practices to parents, other schools, and other communities. If you would like to learn more about our schools and programs, you may go to our website at www.thehelpgroup.org. You can email our admissions department at admissions at thehelpgroup.org, or you can call us at 877-943-5747. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you choosing to spend your valuable time with us today. We at The Help Group are here for you when you need us. Please hold on tight to the ones you love and reach out to those with whom you have lost touch. We need each other now more than ever. Have a great rest of your day, and we hope you make the best of your holiday season.